when the gold price starts to go bonkers, then everyone's going to want to know what the story is. Well, it's pretty simple. We're creating too many dollars. Why does everything cost so much? I'll tell you why things cost so much, just like you said. <laughs> they keep printing this stuff more and more, but all the time, all the time. And the one characteristic about a country that debases its currency and goes to a paper currency, the currency always self-destructs. It always ends. Gold and silver do an accounting periodically throughout history. It's really exciting to see this. They automatically revalue themselves when the public wakes up and they catch up to all the currency that's been produced. But to me, I've been saying this for a number of years now, silver is the biggest opportunity I have ever seen. In 1980, it took a thousand ounces of silver to buy a single family median price home. That day will come again, but it's probably going to be less than 500 ounces. You want to buy a single family median price home outright, no payments, no down payment, 100% cash flow, put $8,000 aside today. <laughs> You're going to be able to do it in the in future. It's just history repeating. In silver. Silver, I'm don't, sorry. Don't silver. hold cash. Right. Cash Gold is good too, but it won't perform as well. Is trash. Exactly. Repeat after me. Cash, cash is, is trash. trash. If you can understand that one, your whole paradigm will shift. So what's the good news? <laughs> <laughs> We're in New Zealand now. This is the final stop on a Rich Dad tour. I've been on a tour with Robert Kiyosaki doing these Rich Dad events in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. Yeah, what an incredible ride and what an incredible view. New Zealand is absolutely incredible. Auckland is beautiful. This opportunity isn't going to last for long. There are these brief moments throughout history that go by, you know, as far as historic time, they go by in the blink of an eye, where the safest place to be, the place where people run to to protect their financial well-being during economic crisis, gold and silver. They have been the safe haven uh, for your finances for 5,000 years. And there's these brief moments in history where they simultaneously become the asset class that has the single greatest potential gains in absolute purchasing power, and we're in one of those right now. With every, every time they create new currency, and they're doing massive currency creation now, it creates a bubble somewhere. I believe the next great bubble is destined to be commodities and the precious metals. And what's amazing is I left with a bunch of these uh, sort of ugly uh, pieces of paper with pictures of dead guys on them uh, uh, that are from the U.S. and then you arrive in Kuala Lumpur and in Malaysia and you trade them for some prettier pictures, uh, pieces of paper with pictures of people on them. I don't know if they're living or dead or what, but uh, uh, <clears throat> then you leave there and go to Singapore and you trade them for uh, pretty pieces of paper that have uh, now they've got like little windows you can look through in them, a little clear spot, watermarks, all this kind of stuff. And then you get to Australia and you trade them for even, they, they've got more vibrant colors on their currency, which I, I sort of like. I think the American currency is pretty drab and, and uh, way outdated. Uh, it's, uh, we're just catching up to the rest of the world when it comes to the uh, security that's uh, in the notes to make them less counterfeitable. Uh, but um, uh, and then come to New Zealand and trade them again for different pieces of paper and what cracks me up <laughs> is governments are sitting there cranking out this stuff on a printing press just laughing all the way to the bank and we actually work for this right. stuff I mean we, <laughs> we really work our asses off uh, our whole lives for this stuff that they're just cranking out uh, you know uh, at, <laughs> at a tremendous rate here and it transfers our our true wealth is measured in our time uh, and you know it's our labor and and the time that we have in our lives to uh, create things and uh, they're able to uh, get some of that time and labor at no expense by just cranking out this stuff it's amazing this will sound a little bit weird to some of the viewers but i try to differentiate between currency and, and money currency has to be uh, a 
medium of exchange. We've got to be able to buy and sell things with it. A unit of account. Uh, it's got to be portable, divisible, which means you can make change, durable, and then something called fungible. Fungible means that each unit is interchangeable. Uh, the, a dollar in my pocket buys the same amount as a dollar in your pocket. No difference to them. Uh, <clears throat> money has to have all of those attributes, plus it has to be a store of value over long periods of time. If this is sunk on a boat, uh, on a ship, uh, now, or uh, it was a 500 years ago, you dig it up, it has tremendous value. There will be numismatic value plus the real value of gold. This sinks, you put it to the bottom, and who, who cares? You know, this loses uh, probably 5 to 10% a year in value. It's amazing. It was a long uh, road and series of, of uh, very small transitions to get here. But basically, you know, we used to use gold and silver, and then they come out with representations for gold and silver. All the currency in the United States, and in most countries, was redeemable for gold or silver at one time. In the United States, our currency used to say there have been deposited with the Treasury of the United States $100 in gold coin payable to the bearer upon demand. You go into any bank, slap down your currency on the counter, and ask for your money, your gold and silver, and they would give it to you. Then, uh, you know, we were on something called the classical gold standard uh, the, that started in about um, 1873 in Germany and by 1900 almost every country on the planet was on this gold standard where you had a certain amount of gold in the treasury and you created a certain amount of notes that equaled the amount of gold in the treasury. So it was a one-to-one -one ratio, it was fully backed. Fiat means a, an order by an authority that has the uh, power to enforce that order or a decree. And so the government, uh, governments can enforce the value of their currency or make sure that their currency is the currency that's used by making taxes only payable in that currency. So fiat currencies are given value by government decree. Uh, no, there's no intrinsic value to them. In fact, you know, costs about six cents to create a, a dollar bill or a hundred dollar bill but basically there's um, maybe three cents worth of paper and ink and then some labor and transport and all that stuff except they've ruined the piece of paper you can't write a list on it now because they printed it with ink so basically uh, you know one thing you find out is all fiat currencies eventually fall to their intrinsic value uh, which because they've ruined it by putting ink on it is the uh, the amount of energy you can extract from it, the amount of BTUs from combustion <laughs> when you burn it. And uh, you saw that during the Weimar hyperinflation. People used the currency as fuel to heat their house. Currencies have been backed by oil, by gold and silver, by land. Uh, well, as soon as you remove something that you can't, something that puts uh, financial constraint on them, uh, where you can't just print as much of it as you want, the currency is pretty much doomed. It's beyond astonishing. And if, yeah. it, it was, if it wasn't for the horrific effects, it would be more ludicrous. It would be actually comical that we could stand up and, and have some fun with it. But the, it is actually horrific. When you look back in history for the last 3,000 years, every episode of this kind of silly crap ended very, very badly. You can see them repeating the same stupid mistakes today. And uh, those mistakes, you go through history and you see something that's happened a hundred times in the past, and then you see them doing the same thing to our currency supply today, the same, you know, in the U.S., the deficit spending is out of control. And the currency creation, if you, well, uh, we'll put up a chart of base money in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's a chart of, uh, of the cash in circulation, currency in circulation, plus the deposits that the commercial banks have at the Federal Reserve. And uh, it took 200 years to go from zero dollars in existence, paper dollars, to 825 billion paper dollars that exist. And then it took just a few months to go uh, from that to, uh, to about 1.75 trillion. Uh, and that was with the <clears throat> Bear Stearns, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac bailouts. And then we had, uh, in March of 
2008, and I'm sorry, March of 2009, they announced another 1.2 trillion dollars uh, worth of. And part of that is actually purchasing bonds directly from the Treasury. Now, when they do that, that's just printing currency. That's like just running the, the printing press. But um, so the total comes to about three trillion paper dollars that will exist very shortly here. Um, that's an expand. I mean, from from eight hundred and twenty-five billion to three trillion is an expansion of almost four times. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So there will be more this printed than ever before, which means. The dollar keeps coming down and other things keep going up. And that's really what's going to happen. It's, it's predictable. And eventually this will go to its true worth, zero. So all of you savers out there and people trying to save this trash, you're going to lose big time. They just type them into a computer, the dollars. They don't have to print them anymore. <laughs> it used to be that you had to mint coinage to expand the currency supply. Then you had to print paper to expand the currency supply. But now all you do is you add zeros to it. <laughs> Just <laughs> and boom, you know, it's 10 times. They don't even have to print this trash anymore. Right. It's electronic. That is how fast it's going to hit people. If I can, as a member of Congress, I can find out more information about what the CIA is doing than what the uh, FOMC is doing, the, uh, the central bank, what they're doing on monetary policy. That's very, very secretive. The Federal Reserve has be give, been given the power and the authority to create money out of thin air. The way it works, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve, which is neither federal nor has reserves, <laughs> it's a private uh, corporation, uh, and you can see this by going to their website and you go to the frequently asked questions. Uh, the first question is, is the Federal Reserve private? And they make their answer very obscure. If you read between the lines, it basically says, well, no, but maybe yes, but sort of no, but really yes, but definitely not. <laughs> That's what it says. Uh, then, second question, does the Federal Reserve have stockholders? Answer, yes, and by law they are paid a 6% dividend. And it couldn't be more clear. So in the, answer, in the answer to the second question lies the answer to the first. There is no federal agency that has stockholders. If it's got stockholders, it's private. It's that simple. And, but the way they create currency, uh, the Treasury uh, creates a pretty piece of paper with some ink on it called a bond, and that's basically an IOU. Uh, they're going to borrow something from somebody, and it says IOU, whatever, you're, whatever I'm borrowing, plus interest over 30 years at such and such percentage. The Federal Reserve then opens up their big old checkbook that has a zero balance in it. They're broke. There's nothing there. It's 0, 0.00 is the balance. <laughs> and they write a check uh, for that hundred dollars, or in the case of today, trillions, you know. But they write that check and uh, hand that to the Treasury, and when they give that to the Treasury, that currency springs into existence. The Treasury then deposits that into the various branches of the government, and the government does uh, throws a few wars, does some deficit spending, what we call pork barrel spending in the United States on uh, things like a bridge to nowhere and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, it eventually ends up in government employees' hands, in the contractors' hands, and so on, and gets deposited into private banks. And then comes the miracle of fractional reserve banking. Say for every ten dollars that you deposit in, an, in your checking account, uh, each country will have its own reserve ratios, but uh, in the United States for years we had a ten percent reserve ratio on checking accounts. They deposit it into a checking account, the bank is allowed to loan out, if you deposit ten, they're allowed to loan out nine. And that gets loaned usually to somebody that's buying something. They're buying a house. They're going to sign a mortgage. Uh, that's how they're borrowing the money. They're signing this mortgage. They take that nine dollars, they buy the house, and that's going to get deposited into the checking account of the seller of the house. And then, since that's in a checking account under a 10 percent reserve ratio, they get to loan out 90 percent of that, which gets redeposited, 90 percent of that, which gets redeposited, and so on. And and for every ten dollars it creates a hundred dollars of brand new currency through fractional reserve banking and that's actually where most of the currency supply comes from. 
the fractional reserve thing. If in the old days anybody wanted to borrow any money, you had to go to the bank and borrow it from the people who were saving money. Yeah. Nobody does that anymore. People aren't saving much to start with, and the money you borrow from a bank does not come from the savers. It comes from the bank, as you say, creating it on the spot when you sign your name to the loan document. It's created on the spot. One of the things I've been ragging about is the reserves in the banks. Reserves in the banks have not increased a dime in 10 years. It's the same $41 billion. There's $41 billion of reserves in the banks against how many trillions? Just 7% of our money supply has a 10% reserve. So that means 0.7% of cash in existence to cover the other, what is that, 97, 99.3% <laughs> It's insane. of the money supply. That's right, that's right. So you talk about fractional reserve. There's no fractional reserve. What's right. the fraction? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. One cent on a million dollars is not much of a fractional reserve. Right. Golly. So getting back to this expansion of the, the, how the money supply is created, most of the currency, uh, about 10% or so is base money, uh, and then which is that hocus-pocus voodoo scam where the Treasury creates an IOU and the Federal Reserve or the central bank of whichever country. <clears throat> so depending on the country, it'll be the Ministry of Finance and then their central bank, uh, which may be labeled Reserve Bank or something like that. Um, and really, when that central bank writes a check, a check is really an IOU too, right? It's an IOU cash, and you can take it to the bank and redeem that check for cash. So they swap IOUs, and currency springs into existence. The thing is, though, after the, the, that currency springs into existence and then it gets magnified by fractional reserve banking, we work our asses off. <laughs> <laughs> for this stuff uh, and save up some of it so that we pay tax uh, to the Treasury so that they can pay back the Federal Reserve or the central bank of whichever country it is the principal plus interest to a private corporation that has uh, it's not federal and it has no reserves and has uh, stockholders. yeah it has <laughs> stockholders it's like it's like the biggest scam that has ever been perpetrated it it's amazing in the United States that we've gone along with this for close to a hundred years. The facts are there. The, yeah. Every fact that there is supports the argument. There is a conspiracy to steal all the money from all of us and give it to the banks. The Federal Reserve makes credit available, but in a way it's, it's fraudulent and it's theft because it does have value, you know, if you go to the bank and they give you a million dollars, if we all take it. But it becomes valuable only by diluting the value of somebody else who's holding money. If there are those who are left saving money, they're being robbed. The majority is highly leveraged out on debt. And are they? The, if, if they win by us going right into a hyperinflation, uh, the mass stupidity is winning at the expense of the banking system. I've never seen the big boys lose in all of monetary history. It's That's the big right. Boys that win. <laughs> yeah. So a short-term deflation would uh, transfer all the pro everybody's property to the banks. To the banks, and then uh, you go into a, a big inflation, and uh, the again the little guys lose, uh, and the banks win. Well, you know, there are people who think that that is actually the conspiracy that's operating, making the whole system go, that that is the point of the whole thing. And it's hard to argue against it. I have never seen a projected deficit come out on target. They always <clears throat> go past whatever their projections are. So if they're projecting a $1.75 trillion deficit, it's going to be 2 or 2.25, something like that, when, the, when all is said and done. And then um, after this uh, 2009, I mean, the, the deficit projections, if you look at a deficit chart with a zero line, you know, balanced budget, this deficit is just like dropping off the bottom of the chart. And then it's supposed to get smaller. In, the, in 2010, 11, 12, we're supposed to have smaller and smaller deficits. But there is this enormous wave of mortgage resets. We're, we are. Uncharted waters. We are in, I think, as Jim Papava said, a perfect storm. I think. Uh, and what's interesting about it, from my perspective, is that we're just starting to see 
you know, the sea's starting to get rough. The Where it's nowhere near what I believe is coming a few years out, which is like the huge tsunami that's going to really, really rock the markets. These are some huge waves in, in 2010 and 2011 of mortgage uh, resets for the adjustable rate, the arms, the, same, the option the arms wave. and so on. Yeah, this second wave. Uh, and it's as much as, as caused the financial crisis in the first place. This time, though, they're probably not going to allow these people to go into foreclosure. What they're going to do is bail them out, which means the deficit spending is just going to get worse in 2010 and 11. They can't do a thing about this. It's too late. It doesn't matter. What matters is how smart you are now. If you think these guys are going to save your family, I think you're in for a sad, rude awakening. I mean, it's one thing to say the, fed the federal budget is in deficit, but every year the supplemental appropriations go far beyond that. So basically we're running $600 billion a year in, excess, in debt every yeah. year just to fund the excesses. They, they claim that the budget deficit is 200 and something or $318 billion. According to the budget. All you have to do, though, to see what the real deficit is, is what did we owe last year and how much do we, we owe, owe this, this year? year? <laughs> That's right. And it's about six hundred mil. Yeah, I think it's seven hundred and fifty billion. Oh, is that much last now? Year. Oh man. And, <laughs> I'm gonna laugh at you. <laughs> makes your head spin. <laughs> it, it's beyond you know, just makes your head explode that this can't be right. Why are we the only guys that seem to understand this? And they're borrowing money, they're going into the end game now because the money they're borrowing is starting to go exponential. It's doubling at a quicker and quicker and quicker rate, and there comes an end game where inter you're borrowing so much money each year to pay the interest on the borrowed money. That's right. That you have to go into hyperinflation. Yes. It, when you, it, it, that, the exponential curve thing is one of the things that's always bothered me. That's a problem uh -huh. with exponential curves. They sooner or later go straight up to infinity. They start off nice and easy. Yeah. Oh, no, no problem. Do, 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 do. We basically, I only owe a penny more this year. After a while, as, as time goes on, that curve gets steeper and steeper. You've got to borrow more and more and more money until suddenly you're into hyperinflation because there's no way out. If you don't hyperinflate the money supply, the thing falls apart. Right. What are you going to do? Well, <clears throat> throughout history, whenever uh, societies create a whole bunch of units of currency, you know, they, they start off with a cer certain amount of money in their society, gold and silver, and they come out with representations of gold and silver, like paper notes or debased coinage, where you've, you're mixing it with copper. And they increase the currency supply. And gold and silver sort of lays dormant. It lays in wait until the public realizes uh, they start to sense the inflation of prices that are caused by the inflation of the currency supply. True inflation is the inflation of the currency supply rising prices of the symptom of the monetary inflation. And then they rush back toward gold and silver to protect their purchasing power, and in doing so, uh, they bid the price up until it accounts for the currency supply. It's an amazing process, and I show this in my book, uh, uh, Rich Dad's Advisor's Guide to Investing in Gold and Silver. Uh, there's a couple of charts in there. With the Federal Reserve, we have hard data, and I've got some data from uh, the Weimar hyperinflation, where gold went from 100 marks an ounce to 87 trillion marks an ounce. But what you see with the Federal Reserve data is that uh, the price of gold, the will of the public, and the free markets do this over and over and over again throughout history. They bid the price of gold and sil silver up. So with the price of gold, the gold at the U.S. Treasury rose in 1934 till its value equaled the value of all the paper dollars in existence that promised to pay gold. In 1980, uh, it did the same thing. Never in the history of the world has this ever happened. In 1971, the U.S. and Nixon convinced the entire world to replace gold and silver with paper money, this stuff. Cash is trash. We had to abandon Bretton Woods because the U.S. vaults were basically getting cleaned out. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. 
Because the Bretton Woods system had put the whole world on a dollar standard, all countries on the planet were backing their currency with dollars. The dollar was then backed by gold at $35 an ounce, make, make, meaning that all currencies were pegged to gold through the dollar and they didn't fluctuate. They, didn't, they weren't floating on, on a, uh, the foreign currency exchange. Uh, all currencies remained pegged to one another through the dollar to gold. When we unpegged from gold in 1971, when Nixon closed the gold window, all currencies became free floating, or I call them free falling against gold. They, they don't actually float. The dollar used to be worth one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Today it's one one thousandth of an ounce, and it's on its way toward less than one ten thousandth pretty soon. Once he unpegged, gold rose and it, it went from 35 to 200 in 74, back down to 100 by late 76, and then up to 850 by 1980. In doing so, in one of the other graphs in my book, I show that it covered the entire currency supply of the United, the, the base money it's called, the paper dollars that exist, uh, at about uh, 400 or 500 dollars an ounce, uh, the value of all the gold at the treasury was equivalent to all the uh, gold, uh, all the paper dollars that existed. So we could have, there was a year where we could have gone back on the gold standard. Then at uh, about six or 650 dollars an ounce, it also covered all outstanding revolving credit or unpaid credit card balances. People don't, most people don't know that when you uh, make a charge and you go to a restaurant and eat or you go to the grocery store and buy something on your credit card. When you sign that credit card, you're expanding the currency supply of the planet. The bank doesn't loan you anything. They create uh, a book entry and you have just created the currency that you allowed, you, you created the currency and you spent it, but you allow the bank to charge you interest on it as though it was theirs. All they did was make a book entry for you. It's a, that's a pretty good scam too. The important thing here is that when you're eating at a restaurant or, or shopping at a grocery store or buying clothes or whatever, when you pay with a credit card, those dollars that you created go into a checking account exactly the same as if you had paid with paper dollars. And they circulate until somebody saves them up and pays down credit card debt. So in my book, I argue that, uh, that you have to include outstanding revolving credit as part of base money for this particular measurement that I'm doing, mm -hmm. which is how gold and uh, continue, how it, it revalues itself. The will of the public and the free markets revalue gold to account for the currency supply. And again, in 1980, there was about three months where it uh, covered all outstanding revolving credit and base money, both. Um, and there was a year where we could have gone back on the gold standard. Well, at the end of my book, I have the same graph and I show the expansion of the currency supply that has happened since. Now, this process, or something very close to it, has been going on since the year 407 BC with the first great inflation in Athens. And it, it happened several times in Rome. There were a couple of hyperinflations during the French Revolution. But it happens over and over and over again uh, on this planet, and it's 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 not like clockwork, but it's it's highly reliable. It, it, when a government abuses its currency system, gold will do this. And uh, at the end of the book, I show it would take seventy-three hundred dollars an ounce for history to repeat and for it to do the same thing that it has done hundreds and hundreds of times throughout history. However, <laughs> the currency supply base money is just exploding. Uh, outstanding revolving credit topped a trillion dollars for the first time this year. And so uh, for history to repeat today and the, for gold to cover that portion of the currency supply that it covered in 1980, 1934, uh, 1923 in, the, in Weimar Germany, and, and like I said, hundreds of times throughout history, it now requires about a $15,000 per ounce price if the U.S. stops all the ridiculous deficit spending and currency creation that they're doing if they stop that today. And they're not going to. Is there ever any example in history of a government being able to print or borrow its way to prosperity? Only temporarily. And I would say that we're in that stage right now. We're temporarily very wealthy 
because there's still this trust in the dollar. And I would say 30 years, uh, since it's just pure fiat money, since 71, 30 some years now, uh, that uh, we have on the short run benefited by this. But long term, no, I don't think there's any example. Uh, the longer it goes, uh, uh, and, and the more uh, pervasive it is, uh, the more likely it is you're going to end up with runaway inflation. You know, uh, one of the things I say is, you know, all frauds typically end rather suddenly and rather swiftly. And this is why I think in the past we've seen such parabolic curves upwards in the gold price at times, or even just qu very quick revaluations at times, because, you know, in, in all currencies, because their currencies, when they, when they start to die and people lo lose confidence in the fraud, people aren't g going to gold and silver in mass hysteria or in a or uh, you know, it's it's a sudden. It's a sudden. <laughs> when it happens, it is a sudden realization of rationality that is hitting the marketplace, and it's harder to stop rational thought than 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 anything else. It's not people going crazy for gold and silver. It's them waking up out of their delusions of paper money, mm -hmm. and just like Enron was a fraud and collapsed suddenly, so too will our dollar. Gold and silver do an accounting periodically throughout history. It's really exciting to see this. They automatically revalue themselves when the public wakes up and they catch up to all the currency that's been produced. And it, it is, there's this same tiny little pile of two billion ounces of gold that there was back in 1980. And the pile of silver has gone from 2.2 billion ounces to 300 million. Today, there's 8.3 times more gold available for investors to buy than there is silver. I want you guys to hear what, I don't even hear what he just said, okay? It's, it, to me, I've been saying this for a number of years now, silver is the biggest opportunity I have ever seen, bigger than real estate, bigger than anything else. The wealth transfer that is going on right now is enormous. This is the greatest opportunity in the history of mankind because this is going to be the greatest wealth transfer in the history of mankind. Never before have all the world's currencies been fiat currencies at the same time. This is the very first time that that has happened. Uh, and gold being a freely traded separate commodity slash money. Right now, gold has begun this accounting again, although <laughs> this time it's going to be worldwide. And this time there's a blizzard of paper right now. Uh, and uh, all that paper throughout history tries to come and land on this same tiny little pile of metal periodically, uh, and uh, the pile of silver is one-tenth the size, roughly, that it was in 1980, the last time that uh, silver hit uh, 50 bucks. Today it's 15 bucks, roughly. Uh, silver is just one of the most undervalued things that there is. There's uh, so little of it uh, today. Uh, the past uh, three, four years uh, or so have seen the, the above ground supplies of, of silver measured, if you're measuring it at, at, as a percentage of usage rates, however how much we're using. There's a good graph that uh, the CPM group, which is one of the uh, two agencies that are used by the industry, the precious metals industry, they're hired to uh, do worldwide audits of supply and demand and, and uh, where that gold and the precious metals are being used. Um, they have a, a graph where they show it as uh, how many months of supply are above ground. In other words, if you shut off mining at any given moment, how, much, how long would the silver or gold that we have above ground last? And <clears throat> normally, uh, before the 60s, we always had like 10, 20 years or more of supply. Uh, throughout the um, 80s, 70s and 80s, it sort of bounced around between two and a half and five years. Uh, and then in the 90s, it started falling. And by 2006, we were down to three months. Three months of above ground supplies compared to like 10 years normally. Uh, so. Uh, silver is extremely rare. For the first time in human history, there is more gold for investors to buy than silver. That has never happened before. In fact, if you took all the gold and put it into a cube, you could fit it on a tennis court. 
it would be a little bit less than 20 meters on each side. But silver is far more rare. If you put it into a cube, it would measure a little bit less than 12 meters on each side. So I believe silver is the better investment of the two. The dynamics of this bull market, this new bull market, are completely different than the last bull market. In the last bull market, I mean, who were the people that drove uh, gold up to $850 and silver to 50 bucks? It was basically North America and Western Europe. The entire USSR, which, you know, all of Eastern Europe and Russia, uh, that was a state-run economy. You couldn't buy gold or silver there. There was no exchanges, there was no place to buy it. China, India, Mexico, South America, these were basically all farming-based economies. Uh, these farmers didn't have any excess currency to buy gold and silver with, and even if they did, there were no exchanges in these countries either, so it couldn't have affected the worldwide spot price. Today, the entire world can buy gold and silver, and there are billionaires in all of those countries, and you got this, things like the Shanghai Stock Exchange. You know, this didn't exist back then. We are the first to offer silver bullion as an investment opportunity. The price for the first batch of the bullion is set very low, close to the cost of the raw material. The investment threshold is not high, and it is more suitable for the general public. Silver is much cheaper than gold. So there will come a day where all of the things like um, the information that uh, silver is more rare than gold, that's going to become common knowledge. Right now, it's not one in 10,000 people that know this. But there's going to come a day where the majority of the people that are interested in investing or markets or have uh, a retirement account, if they've got anything, you know, if they're not starving people in Africa, they are going to know something about gold and silver, and they're going to find out that silver is more rare than gold. Where do you think the price is going to go then? If we do have a currency collapse, like there have been other currency collapses mm -hmm. around the world, you know, people will go to the precious metals, and the precious metals will have a, um, a price that we can't imagine. Uh, you might even get to the situation where people will not want to accept dollars uh, in exchange for their, um, for their gold and silver. They're going to want No matter how many zeros. The difference between gold and silver is gold is hoarded, silver is consumed. Silver is an industrial precious metal. It is used in cell phones, telephones, computers, electric lights, everywhere. The more information age we become, the more we use silver. And what, what uh, Michael is saying is that stockpile is at all-time lows, and they're not discovering much more. Silver is the most reflective, most electrically conductive, and most thermally conductive element that there is. And in most cases, there is no replacement. It's an element not a compound or a molecule. So you can't like rearrange a bunch of atoms in a molecule and, and come up with an alternative for silver. It's a single atom. You know, every time you use up a cell, you know, you get a new cell phone and you throw away your old one or whatever, uh, whenever you type, you're typing on silver. You look at a DVD or a CD, you're looking at silver. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at silver. And eventually all that stuff ends up in landfills. And in most cases, it's not economically feasible to recover the silver out of these products. Uh, my business partner, Brent Harms, just uh, wrote an article called Christmas Time in a Silver Mine. And uh, he was down in Mexico during Christmas and was able to uh, go down inside a, uh, a working silver mine. And they were telling him how a lot of the silver mines are currently being mothballed right now because they can't uh, dig it up and sell it at a profit at these prices. It's below mining costs on the average. There's a few uh, companies out there that can make a profit at this price, but not many. You can't have a commodity that the world is running out of, like silver, that's below mining costs. That's a situation that can't last. It is not crystal ball. You know, it is not about you know, the stuff on television. It is pure supply, demand, economics, fundamentals. As I said, there's two billion people 
wanting the Western lifestyle. Two billion people wanting cell phones, computers, electricity, lights, all of this stuff. I mean, right now, uh, silver's price is 1 65th of gold's price. For the first 2,000 years that gold and silver were, were money, silver's exchange rate to gold, its value, was 1 12th of gold's price on the average. Um, you know, it bounced up and down. But there's a pretty good reason for that. I don't have hard proof on this. I can't tell you exactly what quantities of gold versus silver were in circulation. But one twelfth is a, is a real interesting exchange rate because it's also roughly the uh, amount of mineable supplies of gold and silver in the Earth's crust. There's about 12 times more mineable silver than there is gold. So when you dig it up, the average quantities circulating were probably 12 times more silver circulating than gold, and it was simply the free markets and something called the price discovery mechanism discovering how much gold and silver were in circulation. I use farmers in Florida as an example because that's where a lot of the oranges are grown in the United States. So a farmer in Florida, uh, they grow too many oranges one year and there's this, the supply goes way up and demand is still down here. Price has to fall until orange juice goes below apple juice and enough people switch over to drinking orange juice so that supply rises to meet demand. The next year they have a freeze and supply goes way down here and then prices have to go up high enough to bid those scarce oranges out of the farmers hands to make demand fall to meet the supply and it's a marvelously efficient mechanism that is completely brainless mindless uh, it's the total sum of all the transactions that go on in a society two people trying to strike a price on something and uh, so I believe that the reason for the exchange rate for the first 2,000 years was simply the price discovery mechanism, finding out what quantities of gold and silver were available. Well, right now, there's, uh, silver's value is 1 65th of uh, gold's value, yet there's about eight times more gold for investors to buy than there is silver. This doesn't add up. The free markets will adjust this. Like I said in my book, right now, if they stop creating, creating currency today, um, that means that gold should go to $15,000 an ounce. But silver, I believe it's got to go, it should go down to at least the 10-1 ratio. You know, it should overshoot. Whenever anything gets way out of whack to one side, when it overshoots the mean, it usually, when it reverts to the mean, it overshoots. And the further out of whack it is, the further, further it overshoots. If silver goes to the logical 10 to 1 ratio, that's $1,500 silver. Mm. That means you would have a gain of 100 times on silver versus only uh, 15 times on gold. And if silver, silver should remain more rare than gold even in the peak. So there is a possibility that you could see silver, I mean, it's within the realm of possibility. I'm not saying it's going there but silver's price could be higher than gold's price and that could be by multiples. It's possible that you could see silver at five or eight times gold's price. The theory here is that because of the scarcity of silver and scarcity giving real things value, um, this could be worth as much as or more than gold during a, a super mega spike that could and should happen um, uh, to induce more silver mining. This opportunity isn't going to last for long. It's going to be, a, there are these brief moments throughout history that go by, you know, as far as historic time, they go by in the blink of an eye where the safest place to be, the place where people run to to protect their financial well-being during economic crisis, gold and silver. They have been the safe haven uh, for your finances for 5,000 years. And there's these brief moments in history where they simultaneously become the asset class that has the single uh, greatest potential gains in absolute purchasing power, and we're in one of those right now. And I don't know why anybody would want to have any investment that wasn't the safest thing that there it possibly is, the only thing that has never gone to zero for 5,000 years, and it currently has the p greatest potential of making uh, gains in absolute purchasing power, and it's all due to the recklessness of world governments uh, having to 
You know, the U.S. is doing this massive deficit spending in printing. When we print and dilute our purchasing power, the, d dilute the value of the dollar, what happens to the exchange rate, like here in New Zealand? The Kiwi dollar goes up, the U.S. dollar falls, and then exports from New Zealand to the United States fall. So to get those exports going again, you have to print also. <laughs> and every government on earth is doing that right now. They haven't caught up with the massive printing that we just started uh, with the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bailouts and, so, and stuff. But if you look at currency creation, I, I was showing a chart in Sydney uh, to the audience. There were 6.7 billion Aussie dollars in existence in 1960. There are 1.2 trillion Aussie dollars in existence today. That's 180 times more Aussie dollars in existence. And it's like that with the M2 currency supply of China. It's been exploding at rates that are uh, double digit uh, every year. There's this blizzard of paper. All countries on earth are going into these, uh, if you chart it, the printing of currency is exponential. And uh, uh, that means that gold and silver are eventually going to catch up with all of this paper as they revalue themselves. But they lie in wait for a little while, and then the move sort of happens suddenly. And that's your opportunity. That's this enormous wealth transfer. It really took this economic crisis for people to start waking up. People can feel that there's something wrong. You know, even I was doing these wealth, real estate wealth expos in 2006 with Robert Kiyosaki, and I would get up there and I would say, there's something really wrong with the world economy. You should be able to feel it right now. How many people can feel that there's something wrong? And every hand in the audience would go up. Then I'd start talking about gold and silver, and I'd be absolutely swamped at my booth afterwards. So in just the past few years, people have an innate sense that something has shifted. And uh, so they're willing to accept it now. They're willing to hear it. And that causes demand for the information to rise. The internet is, is the whole reason that uh, instead of uh, one in 10 or 20 people knowing the Federal Reserve is private, now it's one in three. This is one of the things that is going to make gold and silver just explode. You know, markets always do this, like I said, first phase, second phase, and the final blow-off top. That blow-off top is going to be huge. You have uh, basically about um, 10 times the population that can actually go after gold and silver each with 10 times more currency. And then if you look at the number of investors in each population, back in 1980, we were just coming off of uh, uh, where you had company-run pension plans in the United States to the individual retirement accounts. People, you had a few bewildered investors that really didn't uh, know what they were doing and had their broker do things for them. But then we had the NASDAQ bubble in 99, and everybody got a trading platform and became a day trader. Then you had the real estate bubble and everybody started flipping real estate. There's probably in each population at least 10 times more investors. So you've got a factor of 10 times more people, each with, uh, with 10 times more investors in each population, uh, each with at least 10 times more currency. So you've got a, you know, that's, that's a thousand, a factor of a thousand. <laughs> this is going to be huge. And then you couple that with the speed of light. I mean, Today, instead of waiting for Walter Cronkite to you know, turn on that vacuum tube, tube TV set and wait for it to warm up, and then Walter Cronkite tells you the price of gold, today, an investor in Mongolia picks up his Apple iPhone, gets the price of gold, and places a trade right there. Uh, it's a different world. The internet changed everything. What you're going to see happen this time around is something different than what happened in the 1970s. And look at it from this point of view. Back in the 1970s, the U.S. was still the largest creditor nation in the world. Now we're the largest debtor nation in the world. We didn't have this mountain of derivatives hanging over the banks back in the 1970s like we do today. There are other uncertainties. We didn't have the huge trade deficits that we uh, in the 1970s that we have today. We didn't have the huge levels, levels of federal government spending in the 1970s like we did today. I mean, in the late 1970s, it was the Soviet Union that was bogged down in Afghanistan. You know, today we're bogged down in, in, in Iraq. 
I mean, there are a world of differences, and as a consequence of these differences, we may actually go, and this is what my expectation is, we may go into a currency crisis where gold and silver are going to be accepted as the only form of currency in the not-too-distant future, and the dollar is going to go the same way that the continental went. I think Ron Paul has had a huge effect, especially on the awareness of the Federal Reserve. And uh, as a byproduct, he's created an awful lot of gold and silver fans uh, because uh, you know, people in the United States are discovering that uh, you know, it's in our Constitution that only gold and silver can be money in the United States and that the Federal Reserve notes are illegal, unconstitutional money that we're not supposed to be using. The reason why is the currency that founded the, this, uh, the United States, the continental dollar, the first dollar of the United States, went to zero in hyperinflation because the Revolutionary War was basically funded solely on deficit spending. They were just printing the currency and spending it. It started out at a trading at a 1-1 ratio with the Spanish mill dollar. This is before the silver do U.S. silver dollar existed. The Spanish mill dollar had the same weight of silver in it as a U.S. silver dollar. And it fell to where um, by 1779 it was uh, at, it took 1,000 continentals to buy a Spanish mill dollar. By 1783 they were toilet paper. So having just been through a hyperinflation, the founders of, of uh, the United States of America put in the, they, they saw the damage it does, how it wipes out uh, what we would consider the middle class. But it wipes out any, any holders of paper currency, lose all their purchasing power to the holders of real money. And uh, so Ron Paul has brought about a big recognition of that. Uh, I really like Ron Paul. Um, and it's a shame that I wanted him to be president, but at the same time I didn't want him to because he would get blamed for all the stuff that's happening that's really uh, the fault of, of all of the previous presidents, but basically uh, George Bush Jr. and uh, Alan Greenspan. They're the ones that are really to blame for the mess that we're in. And the American public themselves for being allowed to, allowing themselves to be taken for this ride and just going along with it. What do you think the founders of this country would say? I mean, if Thomas Jefferson or Andrew Jackson uh, came back today and took a look at what has happened to their country, to this system that they laid out in the Constitution, what would their view of what our society is, what, what would it be? Do you think they would describe us as socialists, as communists? Yeah, uh, but they, they might want to arrest us and put us in prison, <laughs> especially Congress. <laughs> because, you know, what, what was interesting on the monetary issue, the uh, Monetary Act of, uh, of 1792, the first one after the Constitution, um, said that if you, if you participated in uh, counterfeiting, that you could get the death penalty. And to them, de counterfeiting was printing notes that were worthless. Bills because, of credit. Because uh, they, they knew what it was like when the... Uh, Federal Reserve notes. <laughs> when the, when the uh, continental dollar went to zero, and, and they knew what runaway inflation was, and I'm sure Jefferson and others would say, look, don't you remember uh, you know, what happened? Uh, so if they instituted the death penalty for counterfeiting, he would say, you know, in the moral sense, this is what we've done. We have legalized counterfeiting. You and I can't counterfeit. Fortunately, that's still against the law because it's fraud. But why is it that the government's allowed to do what we're not allowed to do? The, the price is definitely being suppressed. The evidence is in the Commodities and Futures Trading Commission reports. There's a guy named Theodore Butler who has been following this for years and exposing the manipulation. So my hat is off to Ted Butler. Uh, metals leasing uh, is something that's existed for a long time and it, originally it was done for some very legitimate purposes. If a mine is having a um, labor dispute or there's a mine collapse or for some reason they're out of production and they've already sold forward, uh, they've got contracts to deliver uh, metals in the future, uh, they can fulfill those contracts and not lose those customers by leasing gold or silver from somebody that has a stockpile of gold and silver and fulfilling those contracts and then replacing the gold or silver paying back out of their production later on. Refineries can do the same thing uh, but 
there's been a uh, some gold and silver leasing that is for less than legitimate purposes that has been done uh, over the past several years where um, a bullion bank will lease uh, gold from um, the basically the government um, it's probably coming from the Federal Reserve. We don't have hard uh, evidence on uh, any of this, but if you look at GATA.org, that's the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, so GATA.org, um, this is a, a group of commodities analysts and attorneys that have uh, done a spectacular job of compiling a body of evidence that is just so overwhelming that any sane person that looks at it comes to the conclusion that the world's central banks have been doing this process of leasing gold and selling it into the markets uh, to uh, suppress the price. And that uh, there's probably only between 40 and 60 percent of the gold left in these central banks. That somewhere between 40 and 60 percent is already in uh, private hands. It's been sold into the markets to suppress the price. The government or the Federal Reserve or somebody with access to gold will lease it to a bullion bank who then sells it on the open market to push the price down and then they take the proceeds and they'll buy options or futures and then they take the balance and invest they used to invest in US Treasuries that were paying like five percent the lease rate was like at one quarter of one percent and they get to pocket the spread so it's basically free money with no risk. Well, all these contracts have a clause in them where they can pay back in cash. So um, it, <clears throat> I believe that it will cause the price of silver and gold to explode one day uh, simply because they, they don't... If they had to go out and buy the gold and silver on the open market, uh, and replace it, the price would go to the moon. Uh, but even if they don't, if it's exposed that uh, that gold and silver isn't there, that there's a whole lot less of gold and silver in the world than people thought there was, that's also going to make it explode. So it doesn't matter. They're, you know, they're getting caught in, in uh, one of the world's most gigantic short squeezes. And one day we will see these prices just absolutely explode. And um, I want to be on the correct side of this and I want, to, I want to own as much physical gold and silver coins and bars as possible when this happens. If you can't touch it, you don't own it. Uh, how do you see this thing ending? Well, of most importance, there's going to be a, 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 a price explosion, gold and silver, and the people are now are going to make a lot of money from it. Uh, the people that are in it. There's almost no understanding of what this is all about and that's why knowing what God knows is so critical because the market's here it's going here and we know why one of the things that I've done that uh, I don't know anybody else that's noticed this but uh, I download the financial statement of the United States every single year and I keep it on my desk and I highlight certain areas and go through it and one of the things I noticed was um, there's a section uh, for gold where they account for the gold and they, they list so many ounces, and uh, the U.S. government keeps those ounces on the, book, <laughs> on the books at $44.22.22. That's the official price of gold, $44.22. Uh, it's ridiculous, but that's the price. And then, um, later on in a footnote, it'll say that um, the... Uh, that eleven billion dollars worth of the gold has been pledged for gold notes uh, held by the Federal Reserve and then later on it says that the Treasury can redeem those gold notes at any time well if the notes are held by the Treasury the Federal Reserve how can the Treasury redeem them for gold if the Treasury has them it means that the Federal Reserve has the gold and the Treasury has the notes now, when you take $11 billion divided by $44.22.22, uh, $44 it turns out that uh, the U.S. only had $11,500,000,000 worth of gold at that price, and $11 billion of it 
was, has already been given to the Federal Reserve, a private agency with no uh, oversight, uh, and they don't have to account for anything. And the Treasury, who does have to account for something, keeps that on their books with an IOU. You know, basically, they've got these gold notes, these IOUs, gold, back someday. Um, then uh, you look at um, about, it was somebody, can't remember the guy's name, but James Turk uh, uh, is a gold analyst that uh, one of the people that um, writes to him uh, showed that the U.S. Treasury in June of 2007, or maybe it was May of 2007, they changed the way they uh, hold gold on the books. Um, it used to say gold in storage, and that was changed to gold and gold receivables, including loans and swaps where applicable. And it's all accounted for as one line item. It's a single number. So they're keeping track of accounts receivable and inventory as a single number. This is illegal accounting. Any, com any public company that does something like this would end up, people would end up in jail. Uh, this is the type of accounting that caused Enron to crash and the U.S. government appears to be doing this same thing. So the gold from the U.S. Treasury has been given to the Federal Reserve. Uh, we know that we, we see these lease rates. If you look at the supply-demand fundamentals um, and, and you look at price action, uh, the way things add up, uh, there's more gold sold into the market every year than comes from mine supply by a significant amount. That excess gold has to come from somewhere. Um, and this group of attorneys and, and commodities analysts at GATA have done a spectacular job, and I believe everything they have to say about the gold manipulation. And this is what uh, gold leasing is a large part of the manipulation. The other half of this manipulation, I believe, is the exchange traded funds. If you're going to invest in gold and silver, please. Uh, investigate these things totally for yourself before putting a dime into them. Uh, take a look at their Securities and Exchange Commission filings and take a look at their prospectus and read them with a very suspicious eye as to how could these people cheat me. Um, these were armies of the world's best attorneys that worked for the world's largest banks that, that crafted these documents and what you're going to find is that most of these clauses will have a word inserted into them somewhere that will either give the clause two meanings, uh, the opposite meaning from what you think it's saying, or no meaning. Um, and um, also, the entire gold community pretty much has come to the conclusion that uh, these are entities are simply another means of, uh, of manipulating the price of gold and silver. What better way to keep gold from rising than to suck up the majority of the investment capital and then not buy gold with the proceeds. Uh, you can make it mimic uh, the price action of gold with futures and options, not real physical gold in bars. The, if they had all the, if, if GLD for instance, that's the ticker symbol for the gold fund, GLD, if they had all the gold, had accumulated all the gold that they say they have, gold should be at far higher prices than it is today. And that's one of the things that the, all of the precious metals dealers see that is very, very suspicious. So um, our belief is that uh, they don't have the gold and silver they say they have to back them. And they've written in clauses like in uh, the SLV fund, the silver fund, which is also called the iShares. There are clauses uh, written into their prospectus and their, SL, uh, their Securities and Exchange Commission filings to cover these things. Uh, things like um, under certain market conditions where illiquidity exists, the price of the iShares sh might diverge from the price of silver and fall. Their silver is held in exchange vaults. So how could their pile of silver be worth less than the pile of silver next to it? This is what I want to know. I, uh, you know, the reason for having this clause is, is if they were um, not buying the gold and silver that they say they are supposed to be, and then that is exposed, there would be a rush out of that fund. Uh, the price would go down, 
and it would, it would diverge from the price of silver and fall. And so they've just kind of covered their butts so that nobody goes to jail. <laughs> um, also, with regards to the exchange-traded funds, I can't understand why anybody would take the most private investment that somebody can possibly make. When you buy gold or silver, like when you buy from me, it's a private investment that's just between you and I. Uh, government isn't informed that, that you've got precious metals. Uh, and then, but if you deal with these exchange-traded funds, you're taking that ultimate private investment and you're handing it back over to the banks that have caused this financial meltdown in the first place by gambling with your deposits. Uh, I, you're also making it so that it depends on the performance of a counterparty. A, you've got the bank that is going to have to, um, when, when you want to redeem those shares, you sell on your brokerage account and then uh, the bank and the brokerage house have to both perform and, and credit your account and then you can write a check against it finally. When you've got gold and silver, you can walk into any precious metals dealer you can, and sell it. When we go into a blow-off top, I, I guarantee you that people would love to take, to trade your their home or their car or whatever for precious metals. Uh, so that happened back in 1980. It'll happen again. Like I said, everything is waves and cycles, and the great news is that the greatest wealth is created in the shortest period of time when we're going back through these crises. The first phase of any bull market is sort of a stealth phase where it's quiet accumulation. Then the second phase is usually the longest duration and the greatest growth. Uh, and then the final uh, third phase is a blow off top where the market just goes vertical. You remember the NASDAQ in the last three months of 1999. It just went vertical and the, the public, everybody rushed into it. And they all got slaughtered. The herd always comes rushing in at the end and they always get slaughtered. And that's the time you want to sell. You don't want to hold on to gold and silver forever. You want to hold on to it until a median price single family home costs less than 40 ounces of gold or less than 500 ounces of silver. And then you want to trade your gold and silver for real estate, cash flow real estate. Yes, it was. It was like 816, I think, would buy a single family median price home. So what you're saying Except there was a lot more silver yeah. and we aren't, we, we, weren't in as, as, I don't think that that bubble is going to be anything compared to this next bubble. So, in my book I said it wouldn't surprise me to see less than 500 sil ounces of silver by a single family medium price home, which uh, is pretty amazing because you're talking about setting, excuse me, <laughs> talking about setting aside uh, somewhere between um, um, eight and nine thousand dollars today. Uh, to be able to buy a, uh, trade that straight over for a single family medium price home in the United States, which uh, peaked at about $228,000 and now it's falling probably about $200,000 or $195,000 today. I, I'm not, I haven't checked, but it's Realtors Association data. You can go to their website and get the data. Um, but, you know, if, if, gold goes where I think it's going and silver goes to the 10-1 valuation, which is an entirely possible, it could be that just a couple hundred ounces, like 200 ounces of silver, buys a single family medium price home. So, you know, each hundred ounces is only uh, 15, 1600 bucks. So you're talking about... <laughs> Sometimes when I say these things, I can't believe I'm saying them. But they're just entirely logical things, and it's, it's just, yeah, and it's, it's stuff like this has happened before. But it would be like you'd set aside $3,000, $4,000 today in silver and trade it for a home someday in the future, and I don't think it's going to be that long. It's going to be probably between uh, two and five years, maybe a little bit longer, six years, 2015 uh, at the latest, I think. It just, you know, that's what it feels like. If they are not financially literate, if they're not financially educated, they should be. Uh, you know, I'm with the Rich Dad team, and uh, Robert is a big real estate investor, but he gets cash flow real estate, and he gets it in the right sectors. I mean, you know, he moved out of uh, Class A properties several years ago and started moving into uh, B and C rental properties. This is working class properties. These are apartments that rent for less than $500 a month U.S. You know, that's where he's at. 
Well, with the whole popping of the real estate bubble, everybody that gets foreclosed on has to live somewhere. <laughs> so right now there's this huge shortage of, uh, of his type of real estate and high demand. So if you know what you're doing, real estate is still an excellent investment. But for the uneducated uh, investor, yes, get out of your real estate and get into precious metals as soon as possible. I am not a gold bug or a silver bug. I'm a cycles guy. This is the cycle right now for commodities and precious metals. And all you have to do to prove that to yourself is take a single family medium price home and divide it by the price of gold, a barrel of oil, a bushel of wheat, a ton of iron, a pound of copper. Uh, and what you'll find is that uh, real estate and, and stock markets have been falling since somewhere between 99 and 2001, depending on what you choose to measure it with. Uh, but they have been going down against anything tangible. They have, and people think that they've been going up, but people always chase yesterday's news. And that's what they're doing right now. They're chasing yesterday's news. You know, I've been just very, very consistent since 2002. I've been buy, preaching and buying precious metals. And there's going to come a time when it's over with. And uh, when I won't be able to honestly go out and look somebody in the eye and tell them that precious metals is a good investment. And in, instead, I've set up my business so that I'll be able to tell them that, no, precious metals isn't a good investment. Get out. It's time to buy real estate. It's time to buy stocks. Uh, um, so the main thing, get a financial education. Get financially literate. Uh, and right now, uh, we're in the portion of the cycle that's the easiest. Gold and silver are just really, I mean, they're good investments, but at the same time, they're dumb investments. They don't take a lot of financial literacy to, uh, I mean, you buy them and you sit on them until they're overvalued, and then you sell them and buy something else. Uh, so they don't take a lot of work. It takes more of a financial education to be a landlord or uh, to uh, be in the stock markets or the currency exchanges or something like that. This takes uh, a lot of talent, knowledge, and, and maintenance, where uh, with gold and silver, uh, you know, you buy it. The hard part is selling it when, when the top, where is the top, you know? I can measure those things, and I have a team of uh, researchers that that's their job is every day, is just to try and figure out how to measure this stuff uh, so that we can pick the top and get out of it. Because like I said, in my company, we're a group of cycles investors. We're not precious metals bugs. And if, if there's one piece of advice that I would you know, give to your viewers, it's that we're still early on in the cycle of moving out of financial assets, moving into tangible assets of all sorts. And the easiest way to acquire tangible assets is to accumulate gold and silver. So when money does start flooding into gold, when gold gets to 1500 or 2000 a lot of people are going to start looking over at silver that it'll only be 50 bucks an ounce by then and start buying silver. When, when everyone realizes what's happening, it's going to be a, a gold rush into this thing that will be just, it'll just blow people away. It'll be the biggest one in history. Yeah, it's going to make the, the even in the shares, it's going to make the NASDAQ uh, boom look like nothing. And the difference will be this will be for real, and that was, uh, you know, that really was a bubble. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't have a bubble in the gold market and silver markets, but the move itself will be intrinsically real. and, and uh, uh, I believe that this is the next big bubble is the uh, precious metals, commodities, but precious metals especially, because of the helicopter drops they're doing right now, of all the money they're creating, that has to find a home. Well, the stocks had their bubble in 2000. Real estate had its bubble in 2006. And, uh, you know, what, what's the next asset class to go into a bubble? Well, then the real difference is that gold and silver are tiny little markets. And as you yeah. say, is, the, is, the, is investing money in the hordes, the institutions, and pension funds, and, and even the general public, when they, when they actually realize what's going on and they all try to get in this little market, that's when you get the ballistic kind of move. Yeah, extraordinary fireworks. I think so. Yeah. Well, like I said, there are these brief moments in history where uh, the safest place to be, the safe haven investment for every second of the last 5,000 years, the only thing that has never gone to zero and can't go to zero, every stock can go to zero. Um, uh, that, for these brief moments, be also becomes the 
place with the single greatest potential gains in purchasing power. If you looked at uh, the 70s bull market from 71 to 80, uh, the top performer was silver, second performer was gold, third performer was oil, fourth per performer was the precious metals mining stocks. Uh, so um, I just, I can't understand why, you know, you mentioned uh, that people don't even do the recommended 10%. Well, why do they recommend 10%? They recommend 10% because they want to make no money off of the other 90%, and those uh, brokers that are saying this, can't, they don't make any money off of the gold and silver. Uh, so they tell you that it's dangerous. You've got to be careful with gold. Don't put any more than 10% in your portfolio as a hedge. What a bunch of crap. Gold was $35 an ounce in 1971. It's, it's now about 1000 and for uh, the Dow, to have had the same performance over that period of time, it would have to be over 26,000 points. It would have to be like 3.8 times higher than it is today. Everything throughout time goes from overvalued to undervalued to overvalued to undervalued. And whatever you're measuring it with is doing the exact opposite wave. So you've, you've got everything. If you look at your house priced in gold or oil, or you look at gold priced in shares of the Dow or real estate, uh, you'll see that everything is trapped in this valuation channel. Uh, gold is done uh, with its down wave and stocks and real estate are done with their up wave and they've just started to revert back. And they're going to con continue this until gold is way overvalued and stocks and real estate are, are way undervalued. And then it's time to get out of your gold and silver. But, you know, we're in this period where governments are abusing their currencies worldwide and gold and silver are going to account for all of this. And so there, there's, like I say, brief moments throughout history where the single, uh, the investment with the single greatest potential gains in purchasing power is also the safest place that you can put your wealth for the past 5,000 years. <laughs> and I'm not gonna let that, let that pass me up, let me tell you. I uh, absolutely went 100% into this. And uh, I believe it absolutely and I will follow what I believe. Thank you. <laughs>
trash is trash. Hi, I'm Mike Maloney. Uh, one of the things I hear most often from my customers is, okay, okay, you've got me convinced already. Uh, I need to buy gold and silver, and I need to buy it right now, but what do I do next? How do I buy? What form do I buy? Well, one of the most important things to remember is to buy real gold and silver, not fool's gold and silver. You need to buy gold and silver coins and bars that you could hold in your hand. Now, you don't have to hold them in your hand. We can store them for you, or we can deliver them to your door. But you want to get real gold and silver. Uh, the U.S. Silver Eagle comes in a really nice case. There's uh, 25 tubes of 20 each in here. It says West Point Mint on it.